My name is John Biganay, and I'm here today with Willis Barnstone, uh, the distinguished translator and my good friend. Willis, why don't we begin at the yes. beginning? Yes. I, I know your first translations were Six Poems by Antonio Machado. How did right. you become a translator, and how did your career grow? Well, you know, I don't, I began writing, I was living quite by accident in Hawthorne Hall, in Hawthorne's room at Bowdoin College. Oh. And my roommate was a World War II rifleman born in India from a son of a, a foster son. He was kind of bitter about this, of a missionary, had fought his way through. He was a philosophy major. Uh, I was a French major, but then the last two years it was mainly philosophy, so we were close. And he had epileptic fits, hmm. and it was freezing cold. And I'd wake up and, it, he, you know, this was before the medicines and it was mm. convulsive. And, and one day he woke me up and I went to my desk in the other room and wrote my first poem. And I fell asleep and 20 minutes later I wrote my second poem. It was either December uh, 1947 or January 1948. And then this was post war, and there were a lot of slightly older, obviously more mature friends. I had a, a French uh, friend uh, named Albert, and a Dane named Olaf Hansen, uh, and a Czech named Slava Klima, mm. who swore his name meant holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they looked at this and they said, ah, oh, Rilke, ah, oh, uh, Valérie. Of course, it went to my head and I haven't stopped. And about the same time, and I really don't remember whether it was, I think it may have been before my sister-in-law, who was not yet my sister-in-law, was studying Spanish with uh, uh, Contra de Albornoz at Mount Holyoke, who had just come from Greece, sent me a poem by Antonio Machado, uh, Parabola, uh, Había un niño que soñaba con un caballo de cartón, etc. And I, looked, I translated it. Don't ask me why. And I sent it back. So that may have proceeded. And, and then, I don't know, when I was in Greece, I, I learned modern Greek. I, I taught in this little school where the future bad king was there, Constantinos. He was nine years old. And I... And I it was I knew French and Spanish. I'd been at the Sorbonne. I'd taken some certificat. And, well, uh, I translated a novel with my wife uh, from the Farrar Strauss did called Oalis Alexandros, a marvelous novel. Uh, Camille wrote a little brief intro for it. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, that's the lonely fiction I've ever done. Mm. Uh, and then I began to... Uh, I met a man in Paris named Robert Payne, who had written a million books, and he was the best man at my wedding in Paris. And he said I should translate Lorca, and I should get interested in Mao, because he had met him the year before in a cave. Mao and, Zedong. Yeah, he had met him also in '36. He was the first to translate Mao, his, his poem Snow, and mm. so forth. And, and he said he's an interesting poet. We didn't talk politics. And, mm. and it was he who introduced me to all the Romanians there, including Tristan Zada and the philosopher, etc. So he was a sweet person. He said, translate Lorca. So I went home and translated Machalo. Uh. So I started, <laughs> I started and, and then when I got to Greece, I was, you know, I was reading all the Spanish poets, Miguel Hernandez. I was writing poetry in Spanish in Greece and uh, uh, translating Machalo as well as from modern Greek, and writing my own poems, which came out as a book called uh, The Poems of Exchange, 1951, about 120 pages, with the uh, six poems of Machalo. So I stumbled into it. I thought I was an old man at 23 to have been that late into it. You're not even an old man at 80, so you couldn't have been an old man at 23. <laughs> yeah, 80 going on 39, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> so you begin in your own work, and that led you to translation? Was well, what, the reason I, I left out a huge uh, connection, the link was this. Uh, 
I, I was young, attempting to understand truth, all kinds of abstractions, mm -hmm. which is very frustrating if you're doing philosophy, yeah. because you read one system and you find 10 truths, which are totally different than the next system. Mm -hmm. And for the youth, uh, it gives you, I, I loved Henri Bergson, the French philosopher. I read everything I could find by him. Uh, but suddenly, I needed to get back to the thing, to the particular rather than the abstract. And so did my philosophical roommate, who became a painter, and I became a poet. Hmm. And the first poet I read was Rilke. And even though he is, he, he is abstract, as he's also so thingy. He talks about the feelable distances. Uh, and etc. And I read most of these poets in bilingual editions. I'd studied German, and well, so there we are. So I stumbled, and and when I got to Paris, I had a year later. I had a little book ready, and then it got published in Greece. It got big, uh -huh. and I I became close friends with Louis McNeese, all the Greek poets. I met. Seferis in 1950. In 49, I was translating Greek poetry from Sikilianos for the BBC mm. for Lehman's program, uh, New Soundings, etc. So mm -hmm. I, I simply got, I knew Laurie Lee and any poet who came through, and I knew Elitis and Gatsos and Hadidakis. We ate almost every supper together, the wonderful composer. Oh. So I was right in the middle of the literary world which I never lost in Europe. Did you use translation as uh, an apprenticeship for your own poetry? Do you think of, of it as an education? Of course. Yeah. I mean, it goes back and forth. You write poetry, you can translate. I could not have translated the, the Bible into blank verse had I not uh, been a poet and, and, and a formal poet part of the time and uh, a free verse poet part of the time. Can you tell us your memories of some of these wonderful poets that you met? Uh, Tristan Zara, for example, what was he like? Well, Tristan Zara, as I, as I told you last night, was a, uh, a, a gentleman who had survived everything one can survive. Uh, he was, his real name, I believe, was Sammy Rosenfeld or something yeah. like that from Romania. He was the hero of Dada. And when I met him, we went from cafe to cafe and finally to his room. Mm. And every place we went, he pulled out more books to show me. Mm. And he says, they're beautiful. Mais personne ne les lit. Not <laughs> les lit. No one reads them because I am a part of history. Mm. But I should be like my friend Max Jacob, part of literature. That's very nice. Very nice. And you said he was quite a dandy. He was always well. He was always impeccably dressed. Mm. I mean, it wasn't. It was more than bourgeois. It was just tastefully dressed. Mm. And he was in every way a gentleman, dealing with me, who had no political capital to offer him, huh. except that I spoke French and I was American, and we just had delightful afternoons. Mm. And I know you were also very close to Borges. Well, Borges, I knew Borges well for 18 years. And uh, I met him in New York, and I arranged a reading for him at the Y in New York. And then uh, when I got a Fulbright, I was that my year there was in Argentina. We, I lived across the street. We traveled all over Argentina together. I read him all the time. Uh, we were great friends. We'd talk. And then we'd go to the theater, and he'd give a lecture on what we were talking about. It was, it was great fun. And you know, I published some poems of his in Holiday Magazine, which kept sending me all over the world in, 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 uh, and, and Saturday Evening Post. And I'd get some money, and he'd say, let's split it. And then he'd try to tear the money apart, because he was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, he'd say, I, what do these poems sound like? Because he couldn't read. Of so I'd read a line, and I have this lousy voice, and he has a deep, resonant voice, and he would 
read them and then he'd say, I que lindo, <laughs> reading really about his own poem. It was, and of course, like any gentleman, he'd say, oh, the translation improves it so much, I'll have to change the original. <laughs> and you know, you go back and forth. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I love Borges. I think I told you my last conversation with him was, was in Beijing in the late fall, close to uh, 65, uh, 85. And I had arranged through the, America, through the Argentine ambassador to China, uh, a delightful man who went back to, to Argentina specifically to see Borges and hand him an invitation. And we spoke and uh, on the phone. And he said, of course I want to go to China, and no. gave a million reasons. But he had already had, his doctor wouldn't let him go because he had cancer. and he, so a year later, he was dead in Geneva. Yeah. Wow. And you actually work with him on the translation of some sonnets? Do I remember oh, that correctly? Oh, many, many. And, and my goal with my son Tony is to do the complete sonnets. Yeah. I, I published about 40 sonnets in a book called Six Masters of the Spanish Sonnet, and, and lots of other Borges poems in, in a book that Grove Press put out many years ago. But uh, for me, uh, you know, there are many great sonneteers in the 20th century, Auden and Lorca and Miguel Hernández, and even people don't know it, but César Vallejo has about 40 sonnets. Really? Yes, absolutely fabulous ones. Daring, wonderful, and what an ear he has. Hmm. Vallejo. Vallejo. Yeah. I mean, the master, master, master poet of Latin America. So yeah. we'd like to do, there are only about 140 sonnets. And did you collaborate with Borges on the translations? Yes, his yes. he'd was... keep coming to my place and I'd say, and one time, a very amusing thing, I was translating a poem called Camden, uh, 1892 or something, and, uh, uh, and uh, where Walt Whitman lived. Yes. And the last line was, I was Walt Whitman. And I gave an off, uh, rhyme, didn't make the exact rhyme. So Borges sent his editor from, I can't remember now, his main editor from his publisher over to the house. His name was Carlos Frias, who knocked at the door. And I said, hi, Carlos, what's up? And he said, well, Borges has a message. I said, why didn't he call me? He's across the street. He said, well, he's a discreet gentleman. Oh, this sounds serious. What's the matter? He says, it's about your translations. He said, he said, you know, Borges, is, he, he doesn't write uh, 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 assonant. He writes consonant, which means exact rhymes. And uh, he's not writing ballads. And I said, well, you know, Borges is modern. He loves Emily Dickinson. But maybe he doesn't quite realize that in English, we're so flexible. And there's Wilfred Owen. Borges says, try a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried a little harder. And I realized it's just as easy to go all the way. It's easier because instead of having two choices or 10 choices, you have 20 choices. And when you have that abundance of choices, then you can keep form and meaning uh, well, and be closer in meaning. When I get home, I'm going to write above, on the wall above my desk, try a little harder. <laughs> try a little harder. <laughs> it sounds like it hurts. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> motors, but that was Borges. Do you have a, a favorite Spanish poet of all that you've yes. translated? Yes, but I, I'll answer. I definitely have a favorite Spanish poet of all times. And I'll answer it exactly as Borges did when some woman, at not, an undergraduate, I was with him, he was so funny, uh, at Northwestern asked him, uh, Senor Borges, you know, you must have had a muse someday, someone who inspired you. He said, oh, yes, very, I did. It meant so much to me. Very puzzling, however, because she kept changing her name. <laughs> so to answer your question, I'd say um, I have the one muse, but the names were Antonio Machado, <laughs> San Juan de la Cruz, Miguel Hernández, Pedro Salinas, uh, Quevedo, uh, at least 10 major. I mean, Spanish is so full of major poets. Yeah, well, you don't it, want to have only one American poet or English poet. I mean, how can you have Apollinaire and not have Villon? Exactly. Well, that, that's the answer that my question deserves. Yeah, you're absolutely right. right. <laughs> if, if you know if you're a one beat or one toot horn, yeah. <laughs> it's a little.
sad. It, it sounds truly academic. I don't know if you've ever thought of yourself this way, but uh, I was teaching. I am not a one two horn. No, not that way. <laughs> no. I, I don't know myself because I have so many hats and masks. Well, but there seems to me in reading your work and your translations mm -hmm. two great movements to your, your life as a writer and translator. And it makes me think of John Donne, um, mm -hmm. whose early poetry are all love poems, and mm -hmm. later he embraces faith. Right. Um, and your translations have moved from lovely lyrical poems mm -hmm. in your early mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm to most recently embracing mm -hmm. religious thought um, and your mm -hmm. efforts to retranslate um, the right, Bible. The Bible. Been very important. Well, well, you know, it, it is a faith, but it is a Spinoza faith. In, mm. and it's not a Buddhist faith in la nada and nothingness. And that would be Catholic of, of St. John, this faith. But, but that is simply extinction in order to join God. Uh, my faith is godless. I mean, you could call it uh, uh, whatever you want. I mean, you, these are just words. But I do believe in the mystical experience. Uh, uh, I'm not into any, uh, I've written a book called Poetics of Ecstasy from, uh, uh, from Sappho to Borges to talk about diverse kinds of being elsewhere, which is what ecstasis means in Greek. But uh, uh, I just love and fear religious literature, as I heard part of the words today of the military man, religion makes you kill the enemy, the infidel. So it's not nice. Most of the gods are pretty psychopathic and not fun. Mm. But uh, I love the literature, and I like their inventors. Mm. How, can you, how can we live without Ecclesiastes? Or the Book of Revelations that you read so beautifully last night. Uh, I mean, everything. And how could we live without, I mean, all right, it's terribly bigoted, but Matthew, which it reads like, uh, and Mark, which reads like Hemingway. And the madman Luke. <laughs> and the mad, the madman Luke, whose prodigal son always brings me to tears. I, I, I read a translation, and then my son Tony gets up, because the last sentence, it, it's all unconscious thing that knocks you out. I, 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 I say, I'm, good. I, I'm, a, I'm a tear jerker jerk who, who cries at the worst films. And this is the most beautiful poem, but I can't get through it. The prodigal son, which is actually should be called lost son. Uh, prodigal gives a, a false moralizing to it. Uh, but and then Tony in Mexico got up on the stage and he started to weep. So the introducer finished it for us. <laughs> I had that experience when I first started teaching. I tried to teach um, the part of the Iliad where Priam begs for the body of Hector. Oh. And I couldn't get through it because I just had my first child. And to oh. imagine Priam. Yes, that, there's, I mean, once you have a family, whether it's your earlier family or your, 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 from your own genes or whatever, loins, anything you read, Echoes like, like a like a cry in the between mountains in the Cante Hondo of uh, a Lorca. It goes from one eclipse to another. You know, speaking of, the, of revelation, yes. um, your career has been a revelation you know, to many of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and in just a few days, we, along with your family, are going to celebrate your 80th birthday. Yes. Looking back over Look. these, ah, oh, excellent. You can still do it. <laughs> <laughs> Both looking ahead and looking back, how do you view your own life? Are you? Well, you know, what can I say? I hide because I have a big mouth. Mm. So, uh, I, I mean, my children are always shutting me up, and they're quite correct. And I, because I love people, and uh, I used to be very shy, and but, but I know the only way I can work is. And I, I'm not being coy when I say that, but my phone, no, it's listed nowhere under my name. And, and I know I lose a lot of publications and so forth because of that. But I go for months and I, I, I get 10 telephone calls, mm. unless it's a publisher urgently speaking to me, that kind of thing. Well, I know I speak for me. And, I, and, I, and, I, and it's the only, I mean, I love coming here. But you know you lose much of a week. Yeah. to come a whole week. I don't have that. It's not because of death or anything. It's just that I get 
so many commitments, which I love to do. So I do wear myself out, but it doesn't seem to wear my brain out or my body. I do a tremendous amount of exercise every day. Yeah. Well, an exhaustible and eloquent voice, and it's been a great pleasure talking to you this afternoon. Thank you. Gosh. Yeah. And happy birthday. Thank you, John. <laughs> Jean. <laughs>